by uh, September 1939, they had found suddenly that the army that they had bitten off more than they could chew because the war in China had bogged down and their um, thrusts north towards the Mongolian border had brought them into contact with the Soviet Union. There were a series of brief exchanges in which the Japanese got thoroughly tailed up. They suited the peace very quickly. And as a result, the army lost its influence. So what to do? And the South faction, the Navy, now basically took control of Japan's destiny in saying, we need our resources, we need our iron ore, we need our rubber, we need our tin, we need our oil, we need to get it from the Far East and the South Pacific. The essential result of this was is that when war came in December 1941, it was a war on two fronts. The one thing that the Axis powers in particular did not want to have, and especially with Japan, because of the limits on their war fighting, their total war fighting capabilities. Now, since the Japanese were now in charge of, uh, the, I apologise, the Imperial Navy was now in charge of the strategy and doctrine, what were they going to follow? And it is the title of that. The Kantai Kesson, decisive battle, which arose from the teachings of Admiral Alfred Mahan, the great naval strategist of the turn of the century, who was uh, admired throughout the world for his principles of naval warfare, and particularly by the Japanese. However, with a twist, Mahan always recognised that the fighting of a decisive battle was a means to a distant end. That a single battle, in his view, could not decide, uh, unless it was quite extraordinary circumstances, the entire outcome of a war. Whereas the Japanese naval staff particularly saw differently. They saw the idea of a decisive battle resulting in an immediate victory. That it was so overwhelming that it would crush the opposition. Something like what had happened with, at Tsushima in 1905 where they had basically wiped out three quarters of the Russian fleet. So, how did they intend to go about this? Well, in the 1930s, the Kantai Kesen was viewed as a defensive action. The general idea was fought somewhere in the area of the Mariana Islands of the Philippine Sea, the idea being that the US Pacific Fleet would proceed to the aid of the Americans and forces in the Philippines. It would be whittled down by attrition on the way by Japanese air and submarine forces. And so by the time there was a major engagement, the American superiority in battleships, which was about 15 to 9 on ratio, would have been whittled down to something that the Japanese could accommodate and the idea was that the Pacific Fleet would be defeated there and then and the Americans would be forced to sue for peace. <coughs> However, in September 39, when um, Admiral um, Yamamoto Isakuru took over as Commander-in-Chief of the Combined Fleet, he thought to himself, hang on, we can do better than this. We don't need battleships. We've got four carriers, big carriers. We've got another two shortly to end the commission. Why don't we hit we have to hit the Americans to have any hope of being the Americans. We have to hit them at the precise moment that the war starts. And this was with uh, considerable encouragement from what they observed from uh, the um, British raid at Taranto in, in November 1940 against the Italian fleet. This inspired the Japanese to begin planning the attack on Pearl Harbor, which was basically meant to catch the Pacific fleet. All of them, bang, gone, the Americans would have alternative but to suit for peace. Now the second element of Japanese doctrine was known as the Kenteki Hisen and this is particularly important, it's called fight the enemy on the side and as you can see on the screens it was a total commitment to the offensive, to the, ex to the exclusion of all sensible defensive preparations. Convoys and convoy protection were virtually unknown. In fact, they were to have a convoy system until 1943. Neglected their island defences, particularly within the mandated islands that they had gained at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 in the Central Pacific. <coughs> Virtually no effort put into home air defences, which was certainly to come back and bite them in late 1944. Uh, an inability to either comprehend or advance programs in certain areas of advanced technology, particularly radar which cost them very heavily. 
And worst of all was their failure to build up reserves, particularly in the Army and Navy Air Arms. Their idea of putting together a fighting force was to fight short, small, short wars. And with this in mind, they concentrated on developing relatively small elite corps of aviators at the expense of building up large resources for training reserves en masse, which the Allies, of course, in the Second World War, by the Empire Air Training Scheme and the various American schemes were easily, easily able to eclipse them. So, let us now turn to the first four months of the war after Pearl Harbor. Why did the Japanese do so well so quickly in the phase? Because the conditions suited them. The kickoff point was not Japan, it was Indochina. And that meant that when you are attacking the areas in um, the Indonesian archipelago, Malaya, etc., gave them very ready access. They didn't have long supply lines. They were also able to throw in the vast majority of their air and naval assets into the campaign. And in the course of these lightning attacks, they were able to capture developed infrastructure. This is very important. They were able to knock over bases like the, the British naval base at Singapore or the Dutch naval base at Surabaya and a whole plethora of airfields that weren't just airfield sites. They were paved airfields that had been constructed by the Dutch and the British for the war. And all were there for the use of the Japanese. Plus, most importantly of all, was the oil facilities, the oil facilities, the wellheads, the refineries, which were by and large uh, not entirely destroyed or even barely touched by uh, denial uh, programs from the Allies during the retreat. Lastly, of course, the Allied defences were completely unprepared and completely inadequate to deal with uh, this scale of attack. And unlike later Japanese operations, this, this uh, southern offensive, the initial stages, were, was mounted with absolute precision. Everything went according to timetable. Okay. Now, by about the, uh, the stage of mid-March, and even early, in fact, before the uh, for, final fall of the Netherlands East Indies, the Japanese were considering, well, what are we going to do next? We've conquered this brand new empire in the Far East. Originally, it was planned there would be a consolidation phase. They would stop, they would uh, improve their internal lines of supply, they would improve their internal defences, they would fortify their island bases, but this was to be scrapped. They had the bit between their teeth, at least to a certain extent. Because of the uh, conflict between the army and the army, there was going to be no major invasion. India, Salon, <coughs> Australia, Hawaii, all the same. It was just out of the question because the army was so heavily engaged in China and beginning in Burma. So instead, Yamamoto, who had most of the influence at this time, decided on a combination strategy. It's the isolation of Australia, expanding the defence perimeter, and at last engaging the US Pacific Fleet in the decisive battle, that would force the Americans to seek peace. And the influence on this planning of the Doolittle Raid was intense because Yamamoto was extremely concerned about the effect on Japanese public opinion uh, that air attack would, on the home islands would have. Admittedly, the raid was only very small, but it caused a huge furor. And basically, it also cleared away all opposition to Yamamoto's plan. Now, let's have a look at that in slightly bigger detail here. Okay. Stage one was Operation MO. As you can see from the screen, that was to capture principally Port Morsey, Morsby and Tulaga. Same time, Operation RY was to take out Nauru and the Ocean Island as forward bases. This would then be followed by Operations MI and AL, the way of the illusions, and thereafter, Operation FS, which was to extend down through the Fiji Islands of Samar, New Caledonia, and this would effectively isolate Australia, would allow the Japanese to impose an economic blockade. However, Yamamoto was so keen to, invade, to uh, engage the American fleet in a decisive battle 
that the plan was for FS to follow MI and AL. So there was a pause between the South Pacific stage of the two South Pacific, two stages of the uh, South Pacific operations. Now, in reality, <coughs> pardon me, by July, August, we all know what the uh, outcomes were. The Japanese were uh, achieved a tactical victory at the Coral Sea, but a major strategic defeat at the same time because they had failed to capture Port Moresby. They suffered a major tactical and strategic defeat at Midway with the destruction of two thirds of their carrier spearhead. And really the only gains they had from the campaign were a couple of captures in the Aleutian Islands, which had virtually no effect on the remaining course of the war, and the capture of Tulagi, and most importantly, in the Southern Solomons, right opposite Tulagi, the island of Guadalcanal. And Guadalcanal was absolutely key because it was the only place in the Southern Solomons that had an airfield site, which the Japanese were working on at the time. And to control Guadalcanal required command of the sea and command of the air. At the same time, the Japanese wanted Port Moresby, and so this precipitated the two last great offensive campaigns, what were to be the two last great offensive campaigns by the Japanese in the, in the Pacific, and these were the Solomon's campaign and the New Guinea campaign. So let's first turn to the Solomon's campaign. Command of the sea. Now, from August 42 to February 43, it is fair to say that in sheer numbers, naval engagements, the Japanese comprehensively outfought the Americans. Comprehensively. They sank two of their big carriers, reduced their carrier force to one, uh, basically half of their heavy cruiser, half of the American heavy cruiser force, and an Australian heavy cruiser, HMAS Canberra, were lost, <coughs> and they inflicted enormous damage on American destroyer fleet as well. Looking at those figures, however, there is one very significant Japanese lost 20 transports, the Allies lost two. And we will come back to the significance of that in due course. So, why did this outwardly successful naval campaign fail? Firstly, it was simply a question of distance. This wasn't like the Far East where you could just take off from Camran Bay and be in Brunei the next day. Rabaul and Truk were the main bases. Rabaul at the other end of the Solomons and Truk further off in the Carolines. <coughs> it meant that the Japanese fleet to engage the Americans of Guadalcanal would have to persistently travel from Truk and Rabaul down this, what was known as the slot to engage the Americans and then would have to withdraw. And the reason they had to withdraw was because the, Jap the Americans had completed Henderson Field as it was now known and they had localised air cover. Result being, the Japanese could not exercise any form of daylight naval superiority in the absence of their carriers. And while the Japanese were able to put significant forces on, ground forces on Guadalcanal, and go very close, it must be said, to capturing the airfield, they were doomed from the start because of the requirement to put in what was called the Tokyo Express, which was their main supply line, it was destroyers submarines and what they would do is come down the slot at night with barrels on the side and drop the barrels over the side, they would drift, drift ashore on the tide, destroyers would go back to the barrel truck. And that's no way to run a railway. Not a large force of 17, 18,000 men who need all that food, all that ammunition. You just can't supply a force of that magnitude by such fred bare means. Essentially they have the same problem with both Guadalcanal and New Guinea, as the Germans had once their army was surrounded and stunned down. That basically strangled their supplies. The other problem with the Japanese is that though they had given the Americans absolute hiding in a number of night actions, they had never been able to attack the most important target, and that was the transports, which on a number of occasions, including Sabo Island, was still full of supplies. They could have done immeasurable damage to the American presence there, force the Americans to actually back away and possibly even reoccupy it. But they never were able to 
concentrate their attacks on through and get up to the trench. And even at this stage in the war, given that, and even given that they were inflicting these enormous casualties, the productive capacity, the difference in productive capacity was so great that even as this was going on, the Americans were basically not only recruiting and expanding their entire cruiser force, but lifting up their number of carriers that they were eventually able to deploy from something like two to about 15, 16 by the time of the Battle of the Philippines. So there was just no way the Japanese could match this. And when the Japanese, and when it came to actually the replacement of carriers and cruisers in particular, the Japanese ended the war having not issued, having not delivered a single heavy, new heavy cruiser, just three light cruisers, and only one carrier that actually made it into combat with a full air complement, whereas the Americans in the war had about 30. So let's move on to the command of the air. Now, as you've seen there, with Guadalcanal was the main focus of naval operations. This was not the same with New Guinea. New Guinea was largely a land and air campaign. And there were three elements if we look at the South Pacific in general. Solomons, we had the Japanese from the ball, bombing Henderson Field, the American aircraft occasionally from Henderson Field bombing the ball. But it was more the case of the Japanese doing the bombing than the Americans. Whereas, and it was pretty much the same in New Guinea. In fact, um, the Australians were getting absolutely pounded at Port Moresby for much of 1942 from raids from the ball and lay. And the retaliation, likewise, from the Allies against the ball and the Japanese bases was fairly slow to occur. But what was happening, however, is the Allies learned fairly quickly to use their aircraft effectively in anti shipping strikes, which was already taking a toll on the Japanese logistics and supply system. As for Northern Australia, Large numbers of raids were being launched against Darwin, which was, in the respect, a very sensible target. After all, Darwin was right astride the southern boundaries of Indonesia, and that meant that American submarines could operate, or aircraft, and Australian uh, aircraft could operate in Darwin and attack the Japanese lines of supply, those vital lines of supply to get the resources back in Japan. For their part, in the uh, very significant air campaign over northwest, northern and northwest Australia. The Allies were retaliating with attacks against localised Japanese bases, uh, particularly in the uh, Timor Sea. And um, the Yarrafira Sea, I apologise. And uh, this was this basically went on. It's it, it's one of the more obscure areas of um, our understanding of the war. But this, this air campaign went on right up until 1944. In fact, the Japanese didn't, were bombing Darwin long after they were uh, basically expelled as an offensive force from the South Pacific. So, why did it go so pear po faced? Pear shaped, I should say. <laughs> po faced, pear shaped, well, both. Uh, in the air. Said before, constant attrition. You don't have the reserves. <coughs> You're putting untrained flyers into new planes. And this was particularly the case with their carrier air groups, which, although they got the tactical victories in the two carrier engagements during the Solomon's campaign, the Japanese air groups and their carriers were absolutely slaughtered. They had so few of their experienced aviators left. Part of the problem was that because of this emphasis on the offensive, Japanese aircraft were not designed to defend themselves. They didn't have armoured protection. They had no. They had lack of defensive armament, and most importantly, they didn't have self-sealing petrol tanks. So a zero, which was an incredibly <coughs> high line in the top photo, could be brought down basically by a three out three, fairly easy, because there was just no protection whatsoever. And compounding this was the lack of any adequate succession planning, particularly when it came to fight planes. And the lower photograph. Exemplifies this. That is the Mitsubishi A7M Refu, known as the SAM. The designated uh, replacement of Zero, which was meant to replace the Zero in 1943-44, never reached production, and virtually all of the examples were either destroyed in air raids or just left when Japan surrendered for lack of 
this was um, off, this was um, magnified by the fact that while the Japanese were experiencing these problems, allies were churning out aircraft like you could not believe. New aircraft, large numbers of good aircraft, bombers and fighters, multi rail fighters. And because of their excellent training regimes, they were where they had rotation of their frontline pilots to, to, to spur the system of training. Very experienced aviators, far more experienced than what the, uh, what the Japanese could infer. Now we come to the real, really the biggest reason why the Japanese failed in the Southwest Pacific logistics and supply. Let's have a look at the Solomon's campaign to start with. It started pretty early on. As early as late August, they suddenly figured out we can't send big ships. All the tanks and the, the artillery and the supplies, we can't send them down the slots. It's too dangerous, they'll be sunk. And as the Tokyo Express couldn't maintain these levels, it meant that the Japanese troops began to starve. And the last real effort which was made really summed up the failure of, of Japan to understand how to prosecute a lengthy attrition-based offensive war. Second Battle of Guadalcanal, Rear Admiral Tanaka sends 11 big ships down the, the slot and they are all sunk. Some of them reach, actually reach Guadalcanal, they are sunk on the, they are sunk on the beaches. And basically deliver maybe 1,500, 2,000 reinforcements and nothing else. It was an absolute crushing blow to a country which had a very limited merchant marine to start with. And the statistics are compelling. It says down the bottom, 8,500 of 19,200 dead died in combat. The rest, malnutrition, neglect and disease. There was just simply no way that you could maintain an effective fighting force without the backer ups, if you like. Whereas the Japanese weren't able to do it, the Americans and Solomons were because they had access to New Caledonia, to Australia, New Zealand, they had nearby, their lines of supply were much shorter. <coughs> so, let's now move on to what the logistics and supply situation was in New Guinea. I've described it as disproportionate attrition because you can see from the bottom figure, 127,000 Japanese deaths, 90% estimated from non-combat causes. They essentially sent very large numbers of troops, probably in the vicinity of 200,000, uh, well over 200,000, a quarter of a million troops, to various areas of New Guinea. But they starved their own armies because they just couldn't support them. They stopped sending large transports as they'd done in the Solomons. It was all done by barges, small coasters, offshoots of the Tokyo Express. And it was the same with the Japanese air arms. They couldn't get the, they couldn't get the fuel. They couldn't get the spares. And they couldn't get the, they couldn't get the trained pilots uh, as replacements. So when the Japanese did eventually attack, occupy Buna, and then go over the island Stanley's to take Port Moresby, at a certain point, it just fell to pieces because their men were literally starving and their, their troops were just not fit to fight. And for once, and actually for the first time in the war, particularly in New Guinea, they were up against very, very tough opposition in the form of the Australians and to a certain extent the Americans, but most particularly the Australians. I think the Australian, Australian militia proved to be extremely good troops and then when the 7th Division was put in and other Australian units they were just too much for the Japanese, and they were decisively relevant in the Bay, both on the land and the air. It was that their amphibious invasion was a complete disaster. And increasingly, it was a situation in New Guinea that where you got, or we, where Japanese prisoners were captured, they were so starved and emaciated that for most of the soldiers, they were killed in the who had been fighting. That these guys were just not capable of fighting a war without the proper support. Now, as it turned out, there was no one operation that really lowered the, the boom, if you like, on the Japanese and Southwest Pacific. But there were 
a series of decisive engagements which basically made the South Pacific, including South Pacific, including the Bok and New Guinea and the, and the Solomons, a no-go no -go area for the Japanese. First one, well known, the Battle of the Bismarck Sea. Joint effort between the Australian and American air arms, resulting in the loss of eight transports and eight destroyers and the destruction of an entire division. This was a monumental disaster, as MacArthur noted later. This was a monumental disaster for Japan because it basically cut off the beginning. That was it. No more, no more um, large conflicts, no more large resupply. And so from that point of onwards, Papua New Guinea was essentially left to wither on the vine because they simply couldn't supply it. Now, the month, the following month, the Japanese threw in their last big offensive. It was Japan's Eagle Day, as the Luftwaffe had planned in the Battle of Britain. This was Operation I Go. It was Yamamoto's great set piece in aerial engagement. And what he was, the plan was that, yes, we have been driven back, however, now we will hit them with everything we've got and make sure. That they, can, that they, the Allies, cannot conduct a, a counter-attack because all their aircraft and all their ships will be destroyed. And for this particular operation, they put together 340 planes, most vitally of which 160 of them were taken from the carriers, which basically stripped the Japanese uh, carrier groups of their air groups. The carriers were left without aircraft. The attacks commenced on the 1st of April, they were numerous, they were heavy against the listed targets there, but the results were basically insignificant. A single destroyer, two transports, a tank from the Corvette. That was about it. 25 aircraft from the Allies destroyed. Japanese lost 55. Now, that doesn't sound too many, but they also lost a lot more damage, uh, uh, suffered a lot more damage. Um, but Within that 55, the majority of the 55 planes lost were from the carriers. So when the battle was over and, and the offensive was over and Yamamoto thought they had actually won and sent the carrier, sent the carrier based aircraft back to the, to the carriers, the carrier air groups were so weak that the Japanese couldn't put a carrier force into the field until the Battle of the Philippine Sea 14 months later. They were just it completely emasculated their carrier-based air army. Such small losses, it might seem 55 to nothing compared to what the Americans are at the first over Germany. But it was enough because of the extremely narrow pool of uh, experienced aviators which was shrinking by the day. Now Yamamoto, as I said, thought that he had the win. He decided to uh, go and congratulate his frontline units down in the Solomons. This wasn't a particularly good idea because the American pay breakers found out about it. And to put, not, to put it not to <coughs> really they decided to put a hit on him. They put a contractor on Yamamoto. <laughs> bada bing, bada bang, bada boom. La a force of P-38s was assembled. Rendezvoused, rendezvoused off um, Bilale Island on the 18th of April 43. There was uh, Young Mato's command plane, the other second command plane with his staff and guns of staff and some fighter escort. P-38s promptly shot down both the command planes. Yamamoto was killed. This was an absolutely shattering blow for the Japanese Navy for two reasons. Firstly, Yamamoto was the only personality within the Japanese fleet who could keep the warring factions of the Naval General Staff together. He was the only one who had the presence and the reputation to do this. The second problem arising from this was that none of his successors, including his immediate successor, successor Koga, who was uh, killed a few months later in, in a, an air crash with a storm, had anything like um, Yamamoto's strategic 
And from this point onwards, the Japanese naval star began to descend into the realms of fantasy, and particularly when it came to their um, attempts at uh, the Philippine Sea and then later the Gulf, where they believed honestly that their forces could destroy absolutely overwhelming opposition being provided by the United States. The last of these um, decisive engagements, probably, again, fairly not, not fairly well known, was the bombing of Rabaul on the 5th of November 1943. Now, this was important because the Japanese, the one thing about the Japanese in the Solomon's campaign was that they were extremely good at winning surface naval combat. They, they had the best... Without a doubt, they had the best knife fighting forces in the world, even without radar, because they had spent their entire pre-war period training for night naval war. And they and they embarrassed the Americans. Even, even up even up to the late stage of 1943, they were embarrassing the Americans because even though the Americans had radar, the Japanese were so well trained and so well organised that they were just able to run rings around the American forces. The Americans weren't even in the same league. Because the Americans, unlike the Japanese and the British and the Australians, had never been trained to fight at night. They didn't, they wouldn't have known the first thing about night combat before Savo Island, and they had to learn very, very quickly, which they did. And by the end of um, by the end of the war, actually, they had developed into a quite competent night fighting force, which they showed it later they got. Um, so what the story was here was that the um, invasion of Bowdoin Hill had commenced. The Japanese decided, well, we'll send five cruisers down there. We'll see this time if we can destroy the transports at the roadsteads. The Allies got wind of this through their reconnaissance. Over Halsey sent Rio Admiral Sher Sherman with two carriers to launch attacks, backup, land-based backup. They didn't sink any of the cruisers. They sank, they just damaged pretty badly three of them. The others were minor. But it forced them all back to truck. And that was the last time they ever came to the war. But never again. The Japanese had been driven out, effectively out of the Southwest Pacific. And now they were on the defensive. And there was lots worse to come because shortly thereafter the Americans commenced their island popping offensive to the Central Pacific with Nimitz while MacArthur was coming. <coughs> Uh, the Southwest Pacific, <coughs> across the top of New Guinea and then up to the Philippines. And in, um, in February 1944, the Americans inflicted another killer blow when they basically took out truck. It was uh, often called the, uh, the Japanese Pearl Harbor. There were 30 ships sunk. Most of them, virtually all of them, again, supply ships and tankers. Another 270 planes destroyed on the airfields. And basically the Japanese were prostrate. They now had to rely on whatever they had. Now this is not to say that the war, in strategic terms by this time, the war was pretty much a foregone conclusion because Japan no longer had the capacity to attack. But they certainly had the capacity to defend, and they did so. And they took a considerable volume of Allied lives because every island that was attacked, it wouldn't have mattered, it didn't matter if it was Tarawa or Peleliu or Saipan or Iwo Jima or Okinawa, they fought to the death. And they also reconfigured their uh, air forces, of course, in the, in the um, wake of the disaster of the Battle of the Philippine Sea to conduct kamikaze attacks. And uh, it was basically the last the last throw of the dice, and it was extremely effective. Psychologically, it was certainly effective, and, and inflicted massive damage on the Allies, and would have inflicted even more massive damage on the Allies had an invasion of Japan proceeded. So, let's have a look at the outcomes from these campaigns to conclude my talk. Uh, South Pacific was the place where momentum stalled, and momentum in warfare, any form of warfare, it doesn't matter if it's Napoleon marching across the, the steps towards Moscow, or Zirkov's armies heading towards Berlin, etc., etc., 
If you lose momentum, it can be absolutely critical because sometimes you can't get it back. And the Germans after Stalingrad couldn't get it back and the Japanese after the evacuation of Guadalcanal, they were even getting it back. They were then placed on the defensive. They'd also at last inherited something that even Hitler had disparaged before he turned around to suffer and the Soviet Union with Britain still existing. A war on two fronts. You are, if Germany it was a long, a long odds to defeat the Western allies and the Soviet Union with war on two fronts, then the Japanese were at, they were back at the course of they, 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 they were no hope because their, their economy was so puny by comparison with the American war machine, which at that point was pumping out 40, 50,000 aircraft a year. You just can't match that. The Japanese, at the end of the war, there were some figures where the Japanese had aviation industry had built 50,000 aircraft. The Americans had built something like 325,000 aircraft. You just can't. It, it, it's an economics, it was an economic certainty that if the Americans and other allied powers could hold them, that Japan would eventually collapse. And so when the B-29 started entering the Japanese airspace and the American submarines started prowling around the Japanese home islands, there was nothing, I mean nothing, to stop them. They had basically fallen into this war of attrition. And if you want to liken the New Guinea and the Solomon campaigns, which to me are the two most vital campaigns in, in the Pacific War, to uh, other events, you would really say they were somewhat, <sighs> somewhat um, comparable with the Somme or their uh, they were uh, they were meat grinding campaigns. Basically, whoever could withstand the losses and replace their losses would win. These were not quick. This was not like the invasion of Hawaii. It was not like the invasion of the, the Dutch East Indies. It was not like the, 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 the invasion of the Philippines. This was drawn out warfare, and the Japanese were just progressively weakened to the point where the offensive was just no longer possible. And, their and as we've seen earlier, their entire philosophy was tied to the offensive. And when this collapsed, then what did they have left? Not very much. And so, while the end of the war would take, the, the prosecution of war would take two or three years, self-evidently because the Japanese would resist with such fanaticism. It was really over for the Japanese and as a consequence as a threat to this country by this point. And it was by that time, it was saving what you had rather than going any further. And I think it's fair to say that the Southwest Pacific really was where, the Southwest Pacific was for the Japanese, like Stalingrad and Alamein. that they had just reached a point, if you like, like the Peter Principle, at the level of their own incompetence. <laughs> they couldn't go further. And it was interesting that it was the Americans who were able to take the losses and see on, and see on the, uh, the conflict to its end against the Japanese. Yet, 30 years, 20 years later, it was, the, it was American public opinion that basically resulted in the United States withdrawing from Vietnam because it was the Vietnamese who would take the casualties, not the Americans. And whilst the Japanese would take the casualties, they just had nothing to, to back them up in terms of, of material that could bring about a victory. So, in a sense, the end of the South West Pacific campaign was the beginning of the, the long tragedy. Thank you very much. Science. And I said, oh no, I said I'd like to study economics. 
One of the reasons why Yamamoto was actually given command of the combined fleet by... Um, yeah, the threats of the that's exactly yeah, right. Yeah, the army. yeah, that's right. You know, the Lucchese's are coming for you, mate. We've got to put you yeah, out of the sea. So they go, no, get up with you. No, that's right, you know. Lots of, lots of, lots of, you know. There was a lot of use of cement in Tokyo Bay in those days, I'm not sure. Right, keep going. Paul Simidas. That photograph on the screen is great. I mean, HMS Glory was one of the five aircraft carriers which the British constituted in uh, the, the British Pacific Fleet. Yep. The greatest armada of British warships ever assembled in history. Yet, it could only form a task force within the uh, United States 7th uh, Fleet. That vessel first came to Sydney it was re-equipped. Many New Zealanders came over to take over the, uh, the aircraft. Only the United Kingdom, that is the British Empire, and the United States were capable of simultaneously fighting a global war. And to their credit, they served, uh, they saved this country, and arguably, uh, along with the atomic bomb, uh, post-war peace. I think they did um, well, well said, and, and you're completely, completely on the money, particularly as, as um, the British Pacific Fleet was, ba was basically a task group in, in, in the Third Fleet. Hmm. And one thing about the Royal Navy is, actually that's real area of my expertise, and I've written about it losing its command at sea in the first book I wrote called Neglected the Sky. And um, whilst it did lose command at sea because it's, commitment to, to the use of um, naval aircraft was not as efficient as the, tactically and, and materially was not as efficient as the, you know, the Japanese. The Royal Navy did an incredible job considering the enormous casualties it took consistently for five or six years. Americans didn't have that. The, 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 um, the Royal Navy did an incredible job considering, considering that its battle was far bigger than the Americans. I mean, it had to basically uh, deploy forces from the Arctic Circle all the way down into the, into the Far East. And whilst uh, it had a few disasters in the Far East, that's particularly the sinking of the Prince of Wales and Pulse, and then the near catastrophic destruction of uh, the Eastern Fleet, which was forced to withdraw, it did an incredible job to get any ships into the Pacific whatsoever. And I think actually there's a lot of, I'm, I'm, I must be frank about this, I think there's a lot of unjustified criticism of, of the Royal Navy. And actually, in some ways, even more, you could extend that further to the British. I mean, it's, it's very easy to say, and I've, the Singapore strategy is my absolute bread and butter subject, but. It's very easy to say, oh yes, well, you know, come the time, why didn't they have the squadrons of planes? Why didn't they have the, the, the majority of the Royal Navy there, etc., etc., etc. But if you look at the war situation, it was completely impossible because the Royal Navy was being skinned within an inch of its life. And in fact, when you look at what the Royal Navy sent out there, they sent a modern battleship, the Prince of Wales, they sent a battle cruiser, they sent four old battleships, two modern carriers. That was a considerable chunk of their resources that were not in the Mediterranean, that were arguably in far more danger, and not protecting convoys in the Atlantic. And with the, both the Germans, and more importantly than the Germans, the Italians. Everyone always seems to forget about the Italians. Oh yeah, they had terrible, you know, this and that. They had a first class Navy, a really good Navy. And the, the, the British had no end of trouble in, in subduing the Italians in, in the Mediterranean, no, they were, they were seriously good opponent. And on top of this, all, all of a sudden we get the Japanese. Well, my question is, what, what do you expect? You just, you can't be in two places at one time. And especially when you're running up against a Japanese force completely prepared, this, designed for this offensive, all ready to go, massive numbers, qualitative superiority. What do you expect? No. At least they actually put up a fight. They didn't, they didn't, they, they lost, to be, to be sure, you know, Malaya was a disaster. So, Dutch East Indies, but it wasn't completely one way traffic. I mean, they, <coughs> the Allies did inflict a fair amount of punishment. In that and the Japanese, if you think about it, never really took advantage 
of their good fortune. The best chance, people talk about the invasion of Australia, the best chance, which I, which I must say, on the space of the that I would get, mainly for the reasons that I've given here. But as far as Darwin goes, at the point when um, the Dutch East Indies fell in early March, the Japanese had everything there. All they had to do is just go across the Arabic Sea, so like, bang. And if they'd taken Darwin, that would have been an enormous headache for not only, well, it wouldn't have been a headache for them because they had nearby like bases, but could you imagine Darwin and Bond? You, you, to get there from other parts of Australia was, was even harder than getting there from the, from the Dutch East Indies. But they didn't do it. And I think that was probably one of their great errors because if they had taken Darwin, then they would completely have set it allied lines of communication between Asia and Australia. Completely. You couldn't have gone from one side or the other, even though it was difficult or nothing. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be sending massive task forces through the Torres Strait. It's not a particularly smart idea. But, and that was basically the difference between the Pacific, if you like. People often think of the Pacific as including the Far East. And that's wrong, because the Far East and the Pacific, apart from being geographically separated, separated by the Philippines, they're completely different fighting environments. You can't apply the same principles to the Far East, where it's all they're waiting for, than where the Pacific, where you basically have to land, clear both the Allies as well, the, the Allies, the supply the Allies as well, clear space to build airfields, clear space to build harbours and all the rest. You can just basically, you know, do it, it, it's, it's, it's like off the rack, if you like, for the, for the Far East. Anyone else? Far away? It's crazy, no? The um, situation in China, did they have like hundreds of thousands of troops just sitting on the outskirts? No, 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 no. They had they had millions. They had the majority of their army and they were fighting against oh well <coughs> they were fighting against the nationalists and the communists, but it was very much like Vietnam by that stage. The the major offensives had ended, if you if you understand what I mean, they'd driven inland. They'd taken all the coastal cities, and then they were figuring out, oh yeah, well, we've advanced to Chongqing, which they, they went in that particular direction, and they went north. They, there was a very active war, and then the Chinese forces were actually siphoned off to a certain extent to fight in Burma, which was right next door. But they were, they were so far away occupied in China, I, I, I think if they had left the Pacific alone, they, they, they may have prevailed in China against, because the Chinese opposition very fractured between the nationalists and the communists. But they were certainly busy there, and they were busy in more ways than one, because a lot of, a lot of people actually often heave, heave it on the Allies when they say, oh, well, the Allies use nuclear weapons. They use weapons of mass destruction. Well, the Japanese were using chemical and biological weapons yes. in China against the population mm -hmm. and, against China, and against Chinese troops. Yeah. And they were building their own atomic weapons as well in yeah. Korea. So you can't say, Oh, the Japanese got the rough end of the pineapple. The, the reason that the Japanese cities were basically bombed into oblivion and their merchant ships were virtually exterminated was the fact it was their own fault. They didn't. The, where were the fighters that were going to stop them? Where were the where were the, the anti-submarine warfare vessels? They just refused to build them because they all committed to attack, attack. We just might end there, sorry. One more. I've got two more. Two more. Okay, okay, two, no, more. two more. Okay. Yeah, back. Uh, slightly off topic, but you may want to comment. I think I remember reading somewhere that uh, pro, uh, it's probably in the 1930s, due to obligation, I think, under the League of <coughs> Nations, that Australia destroyed some of its best capital ships or, or one of its best capital ships. Is there any? Yeah, no, that, that is actually being misinterpreted somewhat. Um, what actually happened, it was under the um, arrangements for the Washington Naval Treaty in 1922 that Australian capital ships, HMS Australia, the battle cruiser, was classified as a British capital ship, as was, HM, uh, as was the New Zealand, HMNZS New Zealand. Uh, they were both capital, and so the British decided that given that these two battle cruisers were of a fairly old design, I think they were 1906 in the class, they, they decided to, to, uh, to scrap them. It was sacrificed to meet the number. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was called the 5 5 yeah. 3 2 ratio, or 2 2 ratio, because you've got to take it. Mm -hmm. I think I can have one more, yeah. Thanks for your talk. Not a problem. Um, just the influence of what's called victory disease. Oh, yes. Yeah.
And I should, and my apologies, I should have gone into that a bit further. The planning conferences in particular, yes, victory disease. So it's a real factor? It's a huge factor. And, and I'm really glad, glad that you brought that up because it was something that, that I neglected to mention. Victory disease infected their command. And the worst way it infected was their planning. Because, if I can just say this before, it's okay. Perhaps if I go back, oh, well, I won't use the pictures, but you, you just have to look at Midway and the Coral Sea. They're basically fairly easy targets. Okay. You send a couple of task forces to do this, that, and the other, but the Japanese wouldn't do that. They had these incredibly intricate plans. So, in the case of the Coral Sea, I think you had about six or seven different task groups. All that were all meant to coordinate. But they thought they could do this because they had done it in the Far East successfully. Yes, we are the best. We can do this. And then they thought they could do it midway. And they got lax because of victory disease. Because they thought, yes, we are miles better than the Americans. We will crush them. They got very, very lax. And particularly with their intelligence, which was, you know, they, they keep it secrets. Once you break the code, it, it, it wasn't that hard. Fashion, but at least you know what they were doing. Well, I think we might end it there. Can we put our hands together?